<clears throat> hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, June 8th, and this is the weekly market update. As always, the disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not investment advice. I'm not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you individual financial advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so you've heard me talk about the bazookas firing. And, you know, what I have been saying since last summer, we've shown, I've tracked and we have shown in these, uh, occasionally in these uh, videos, the fact that a large, a large majority of the central banks around the world have been in a rate cutting cycles. Obviously, uh, as the post-pandemic inflation rates have receded in many other countries, uh, the high rates that they have were, were creating uh, substantially high real interest rates in some of those countries. And so, excuse me, many of those countries have been cutting rates for some time. And one of the things that I was saying was that that was creating a new liquidity uh, cycle, up cycle, if you will, uh, in liquidity. And that would have a effect on uh, economies around the world. Uh, we, we've seen PMIs now for the globe go above 50, which is expansion. Uh, we've it would also cause uh, more or higher prices in commodities and gold. Uh, you know, that's just a general statement. Obviously, there are intermarket relationships that take place because of currencies and interest rates, but that's the trend, right? And these these liquidity cycles last for some periods of time. The other thing I said was that we would eventually see the big bazookas come out, which were the G7 central banks, uh, like the ECB, the Bank of Canada, you know, Bank of England, and eventually the Fed would all be the last countries to begin their rate cutting cycle because they were some of the last countries to begin their rate raising cycle. So this week we had two central banks uh, bring out the bazookas and begin firing. Now, these are, you know, 25 basis points, but it's a change in trend, right? You had the uh, a trend where rates were rising, then they plateaued for some period of time, and then you begin the next rate cutting cycle. And this has ramifications for investing and uh, where we should be putting money. And uh, again, there's lag effects with this also. It's not like, okay, the, they start cutting rates and then the following day you go out and everything, you know, hard assets are rocketing. That's not, as a matter of fact, we're kind of in a, um, uh, a, a correction with a lot of uh, uh, hard assets for different reasons. But the trend definitely now is in place. And uh, so w this 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 continued li liquefaction, uh, liquidity cycle, up cycle and liquidity, whatever you want to call it, is definitely entrenched in place. And we continue to track it. It's actually starting to accelerate a little bit. And so again, when the big bazookas, the larger economies come out and start cutting rates, well, then that's a whole nother ball game. You know, so that's where we're at. So this is the Bank of Canada in the statement. They said uh, Bank of Canada today reduced its target for the overnight rate to four and three quarters with the bank rate at five and the deposit rate at four and three quarters. The bank is continuing its policy of balance sheet normalization with continued evidence that underlying inflation is easing. Governing Council agreed that monetary policy no longer needs to be restrictive and reduce the policy rate by 25 basis points. Recent data has increased our confidence that inflation will continue to move towards the uh, 2% target. Nonetheless, risks to the inflation outlook remain. Governing Council is closely watching the evolution of core inflation and remains particularly focused on the balance between demand and supply in the economy, inflation expectations, wage growth, and corporate pricing behavior. The bank remains resolute in its commitment to restoring price stability for Canadians. I mean, this is all nonsense. I don't really care about what they think. I, you know, I don't endorse the policies. I'm just telling you what's happening and that what I think will be the result of these policies. Um, again, I'm not a big fan of central banks using um, overnight or their, 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 inter, their ability to raise and lower interest rates to try to manipulate the economy. Um, I don't really think they know what they're doing. They've made 
many errors throughout the years, all these central banks, they'll continue. But again, we have to know what they're doing, what they're planning on doing, because it has such a big impact on these markets and our investments. Okay. And so again, it's kind of that Cantillon effect. You want to be as close to the money printing as possible, as close to the king as possible, who's spending the gold, and that's who's going to benefit. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a couple example or an example later on. So then we had the Bank of Canada. So then we had later on this uh, last week, uh, the European Central Bank cuts interest rates for the first time since 2019. The quarter point reduction comes as inflation in the eurozone cools, prompting the ECB to move before the Federal Reserve in the United States, where rates remain high. As inflation returned within the site, within sight of the bank's 2% target, officials cut by a quarter point their three key interest rates, which apply across all 20 countries that use the euro. The benchmark deposit rate was lowered to 3.75% from 4%, the highest in the bank's 26-year history and where the rate has been set since September. So uh, obviously, if all these banks cut and the Fed holds rates higher, this causes the dollar to be strength strong relative to these currencies. So this is kind of the intermarket relationship. Um, and then the dollar strength obviously spills over into other things like commodities. So these are short term. Again, we're looking at longer term, you know, three to five years here. But, uh, you know, these, these cycles of liquidity can last, you know, anywhere from three to five years also. So, uh, um, this is to be, you know, we got two of the major bazookas have come out and fired. So we'd be looking for the United States uh, or for the Fed here in the U.S. at some point this year, later on the summer, early fall, to to probably start cutting rates. And uh, I think we're starting to see more and more employment. You know, they, they have these employ the employment data is so I don't know. They have these big numbers that come out, and every, a lot of people are really skeptical of the Bureau of Labor Statistics how they're gathering their data because a lot of other data around employment is not showing the same strength. And as I've said before, what happens is you get this headline number like we got on Friday and everybody, you know, the market trades that, um, you know, and then, you know, two months down the line, three months down the line, this number for May or whatever gets revised lower. And that's what's consistently happened. So what's really happening, right? So in the end, uh, I think that a lot of the other uh, metrics for employment are starting to weaken. That's going to come through. Uh, and so, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, again, you know, don't get confused. A lot of times when there's a rate cutting cycle, stocks will usually go down because they're normally cutting rates for a reason because of economic weakness. But even though we may see, you know, a period of weaker equity prices, that will even spill over, you know, a lot of the resource stocks that were invested in their stocks. And so if the stock market is trending down, they're likely to be pulled down also, but uh, they are the first to recover uh, after the initial drawdown. Uh, so, you know, I don't try to trade these things. I'm not a trader. There's some people I, I, I see on Twitter, they trade in things, they're arguing back and forth about they sold gold a couple weeks ago and blah, blah, blah. I don't do that. I look for a longer term trend and this is the trend. We're going to, you know, we're in a we're in a up cycle for liquidity and I have a view that that's going to uh affect hard assets and and uh, resources uh positively over time. Will there be short term or mid term uh pullbacks? Anything's possible. There's always cyclical drawdowns and pullbacks within the context of a secular bull market. So just be aware of that. And be aware that there are intermarket relationships. You know, if these other banks, the ECB is cutting and the Fed isn't, then the euro is going to weaken vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar in the short term, okay, until the Fed gets on board. And, and again, I think by the end of the year, by probably late summer, early fall even, I think the Fed will begin cutting rates. And then you'll have this globalized, synchronized rate cutting cycle and liquidity that will be going into the markets. So this is what we're talking about, about some of the data that's not matching up, right? It's causing confusion. It says, uh, this is the ISM uh, 
Institute for Supply Chain Management, employment outlooks are below 50 and point to forthcoming weakness in the U.S. labor market. You can see here the blue over here, the blue line is the ISM employment manufacturing. Uh, it's below 50. Uh, that means it's contracting. You have the combined, the orange is the combined ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing employment index. It's the orange line. It looks like it's below 50, but may be increasing. And then you have the combined ISM manufacturing, non-manufacturing uh, index, uh, three months smooth. So you're below 50 here, okay? Um, the green line's 50. So, you know, you see that in previous recessions, uh, employment has, you know, trended down significantly, at least the last three recessions. This was a man-made one in 2020, obviously, but the last great financial crisis and then the um, the uh, tech wreck recession. So uh, maybe we just have a mild recession because of some of the dynamics around employment and, sh and the labor force is not the same post-pandemic. Uh, so we'll have to see, but uh, this isn't really, you know, matching um, what we've seen uh, coming out of the BLS. Like I said, again, they, they come out with these numbers that are kind of done with some forecasting and then they have to be revised once the actual data comes through, they get revised lower. So um, this is the kind of stuff that I look at that tells me that something's not right. Um, again, here we go, uh, game of trades, consumer loan defaults, highest since 1987. Uh, delinquency rate on consumer loans. Obviously, these are the recessions. Um, you see, this is the biggest uh, spike since 1987. Um, so I don't know. Well, this actually isn't accurate. Maybe I read, didn't do this correctly. But anyways, we're definitely, you know, spiking. And, you know, again, we go back to that two Americas. Wall Street Journal had an article about the two Americas. I have a slide on that. You know, if you're a wealthy person, if you have cash, um, if you have good employment prospects, you know, you're benefiting uh, from this economy. And unfortunately, a lot of people, um, probably 60% or maybe higher of the people aren't benefiting. And so um, they're, you know, with all of the pandemic money that ran out, and the inflation we had that was about 20% uh, prices rises, at least higher in some categories, people and the wages having not kept up, people are struggling, okay? And so they've turned to debt, credit cards and consumer debt to try to maintain their lifestyle. Um, and not even that, even by necessities at this point. So, uh, you know, this is why we're seeing defaults because, you know, you're going to try to live off debt. And then when that, when you exhaust that, or the ability of your creditors to extend you any more credit, and then you go start defaulting. So this is not a positive trend. Um, this is what you see during recessions. And, um, you know, that's what we're kind of seeing, I think, you know, more of these uh, indicators. But again, I think it's that two-tier economy, right? Um, I know in the Wall Street Journal article I'm going to show here in a minute, um, or, or review one of the things as Norwegian cruise lines is you know they said they're booming their demographic that they go after is booming okay uh, we just had uh, air travel uh, profits for airlines are back to like 30 billion a year now um, so people that have money are you know they're they're making up for lost time they're traveling they're doing the things they want they have the money to spend um, it's just people that are living hand to mouth or, or wage slaves um, that don't have any assets and don't have an ability to take advantage of higher interest rates. You know, like I talked about this last week about T-bill rates, and this is what we're talking about here. You know, uh, these are U.S. government interest expenses, which are skyrocketing. This is great for cash rich individuals and companies. You know, they said that Berkshire Hathaway sitting on $130 billion in cash, well, they don't like have it in a passbook savings account getting 0.25%. They have it spread out around, and they're getting, you know, four and a half, five percent on that money. So they're getting, you know, $8 billion a year in interest on that cash. That's a significant amount of money. And, you know, I, I talked about this before. If, if you're, if you, if you have assets, you know, why not just get 5% in T bills? That's 
almost three quarters of the risk-free long-term returns in the stock market. So you buy T-bills, get 5%, and you have, you know, almost zero risk in the short term uh, as, you know, these treasury securities are considered uh, uh, risk-free assets. So, um, so people are benefiting if you have cash. This is why I keep telling people, you have to, you have to build a grub stake. You have to be in the game. Um, and, you know, this is another example. And when they cut rates, which they eventually will, okay, and increase the balance sheet, again, I think it's in the February issue of the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, my paid, I talk about the Cantillon effect and how being close to the printing press benefits uh, how the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The rich are close to the money creation because they have hold assets. And when the money printing starts and the rates go down, uh, I explain how all this transfers into higher asset prices and yet leads to, you know, so the rich have their assets go up in value and the poor have their prices go up in value. Their standard of living goes down because inflation and prices goes up. And so this is why you got to be in the game. One way or another, you got to figure it out. You got to be in this game. I'm not endorsing that it's the right thing to do. I'm not saying it's fair. I, I'm just telling you how it is. And this is a common mistake. I talked about this in an interview that somebody interviewed me. I'll put it up in the weekly uh, uh, email. Um, you know, it doesn't matter the way you want things to be. What's reality? And then that's how you have to, you know, you have to relate to the world in reality, not the way, not an idealized way that you want it to be. Yes, I wish the Federal Reserve didn't exist. I wish these central banks weren't manipulating interest rates. I wish the government wasn't overspending. I wish a lot of things, but that's not reality. And you have to exist in this world until you give up this mortal coil. And so you have to deal with things for the way they are, not necessarily the way you want them to be. A lot of these people that are ideologues uh, that go and walk around with uh, you know cardboard on uh, uh, stapled to a stick and protest, they're unhappy people. They're not relating to the world. There's some things you can change. There's some things you can't change. And the things you can't change, you need to understand that and then relate to the world the way it is. That's my advice. So here's the Two Americas article. Uh, I'll put a link to it. So it says the U.S. economy keeps throwing up surprises. I agree with this. I, this is really baffling what's going on. Making it difficult to get a read on what's happening for everyone from ordinary investors to the Federal Reserve. A growing disconnect between the fortunes of upper and lower income Americans could account for some of the cross signals. One possible reason for the mix of caution and abandon is that people lower on the income ladder who spend a bigger share of their income on necessities are feeling pinched and less confident about their job prospects. Meanwhile, wealthier households are still spending. What is becoming hard to miss is that companies that serve a wealthier clientele sound much more confident lately, while food makers see shoppers struggling with inflation, cruise lines are booming. And so you can read the article to look into this, but this is kind of what's going on, right? So if you have money, if you have wealth, um, everything's fine. If you don't, you're struggling. And yes, this has long-term social and economic and political ramifications, but you know, right now, it, this is the way it is. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't think this can last forever like this. And I think that's why you're seeing, you know, the ability of somebody like Mr. Trump to still be in the, you know, slightly lead in the presidential race, even though of all of his legal troubles and people's general, you know, both when people are polled, majority of them say they don't like either candidate, but people feel like they have to vote for some lesser evil or something like that. I don't know how they justify it in their mind, but anyways, that's what they people say. And so, but that's what's you know, there's so many people that are just not participating and are feeling left out and are not uh, in on the deal. You know what I'm saying? And they're not benefiting from this economy. And so people are frustrated and angry. So again, here's job opens declining rapidly. OK, <clears throat> this is what we've seen in prior recessions. And look what we see over here. These are total non-farm job openings. This is what I would be looking at rather than these BLS numbers that come out every week that are massaged and then are, re then are, then are uh, uh, you know, uh, they come back two months later 
uh, with a um, updated, you know, lower numbers. I mean, this is, you know, so something's not right, okay? And 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 so when we have one data set that's positive and other ones, several other that are negative, I think you got to look at the preponderance of data and, and go from there. And, and here we go, like service PMI keeps growing. So, you know, this is the uh, sharp rise in U.S. business activity, S&P Global U.S. Services, PMI. I mean, the green lines, the PMI are at 54.8. It's going up. So services part of the economy is expanding. And I, again, I think it's because of, you know, the wealthier people, people, upper middle class or wealthy people, they have money to spend. And you have the, uh, this is a um, three month moving average. So you're above the three month moving average. And this is accelerating upwards, guys. So uh, again, it's another less bifurcated economy. Uh, you know, manufacturing's been in recession for a while. I think it's turned up recently, but you know, I mean, it's just a lot of cross currents. It's hard to get a read on things. A lot of it has to do with, I think, Jim Bianco talks about this, about how things have changed since the pandemic in the labor market. Things have changed about how people uh, spend money, how they live their lives. It's like, so I don't think that analysts have fully accounted for all of the changes that have happened and so maybe the old playbook of looking at things doesn't necessarily apply and it's going to take some time to figure out okay what are the new trends what is the how are people how have things changed since the pandemic in the labor market and consumer spending and, and things like this notwithstanding the fact that you know again you have you know a one over one trillion dollars in interest payments landed on the economy uh, who holds those assets, the right? upper middle classes and wealthy people and institutions and, and, all, and, and the fact that, um, uh, you know, the government is spending at wartime levels deficits. So you have all this cash raining down and where is it going, right? So I want to talk about this, Jesse Felder. NVIDIA had uh, increased its market cap by $1 trillion in 32 days. Um, he says here in this tweet, over the last 32 trading days, NVIDIA has gained more than $1 trillion in market cap. To put that into some perspective, the six-week gain is greater than the total market cap of Berkshire Hathaway, which Warren Buffett has spent six decades in building. So, you know, people will say, well, you know, um, who cares about Warren Buffett? You know, he's compound him and Charlie Munger compound and their team have compounded, you know, capital at about 18 to 19% a year over the last, what, 50, 60 years, whatever it was. And NVIDIA's up 1 trillion, you know, prepare to stay poor, boomer, stuff like that. I don't think NVIDIA will have the same valuation 32 years from now or, or six decades from now. I may be wrong. It may keep going up forever. Anything's possible, I guess. But you're starting to get into the law of large numbers. And this is just another indication in my mind. You know, One of the things that's interesting that I want to kind of point out, if you recall, you know, I was talking about a lot of the news reports. This is six months or a year ago, really started heavy uh, about copper demand because of the ESG and EVs and renewable energy and all this stuff. And then I was also, you remember also I was saying peak ESG, and I would show uh, charts from Bloomberg or other analysts uh, from brokerage firms, Goldman Sachs, whoever, and even um, these think tanks about this linear progression combined annual growth rate of EVs and how much copper demand. And again, you can't, can't just linearize have a linear thinking on everything, okay? Because now it looks like we're at peak ESG. So a lot of people are saying, okay, well, maybe copper demand isn't going to be as great as we thought because this whole EV thing seems to be like, you know, not what we thought it was going to be. And, and so I think I caution when you just start putting, uh, when something's going your way or you think, you know, I report the news in here. This is now casting. I'm telling you what people are saying. And we try to put a, uh, see if it's uh, uh, going to how it's going to affect our investments or if there's opportunity. Okay, it's the same thing with AI. You know, I reported last week about you know the U.S. wants to increase 
uh, nuclear power and the demand for electricity growth because of AI. And, you know, by 2030, AI is going to be this. We're going to need as much power. You have to really caveat a lot of that. I'm not saying it won't happen. It probably will happen, but maybe not to the extent everybody thinks. And so you need to couch things properly and say, okay, is this realistic? Or is somebody just getting a spreadsheet out and saying, okay, well, things are going to grow at 10% a year compounded for the next 20 years on electricity demand. Is that really going to happen? Probably not. Really going to build 200 gigawatts of nuclear by 2050? Probably not. Will we grow some point between zero and 200? Yes. Okay. There will be growth. Uh, it's impossible to know the future certainty. What we're trying to look for is the trends. Is there a change in trend? Okay. But you need to be careful. And same thing with like these stocks, right? Um, they get momentum. You can see the momentum's big. Uh, buying begets more buying because of new headlines and it's a new wave of AI. I've talked about this before. We saw, we've seen this many times throughout the market history and overhyped uh, sectors. And then they end up uh, reverting back to the mean. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen here. I'm not going to say that NVIDIA is not going to keep growing. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I will say that the historical narrative is that I don't think in six decades NVIDIA will be at its valuation. You know, if you're if you're getting these huge profits and it's so profitable and working out, you're going to draw competition to yourself, okay, whether you like it or not. And it's not like they're going to have this. It's tech. We know the history of tech is innovation and leaders that were successful some period of time and then that draws in all kinds of competition or a better mousetrap and then the previous leader becomes a laggard we've seen it in the past I'm not suggesting that's going to happen here what i'm telling you is that seems to be the narrative okay and so it's again the turtle in the hair uh aesop fable okay uh if people have made a lot of money in these things and people have uh, they should be cautioned, cautious, but what happens is in your psychology, when you've had this kind of success this quickly, uh, you start creating narratives or logical fallacies in your mind, how it's going to continue because you're on that rush. It's like somebody that's on a crap table rush, right? Uh, these, all the dice are coming up, coming up, coming up, and all of a sudden, bang, you know, can you start getting more confident? You don't want the rush to end. There's a lot of, a lot of chemical reactions going on in your head. And so, you know, the, you know, I'm not making an excuse. I don't deal with tech stocks because I don't have an advantage there. I'm not a tech person. Um, and so this is why I stay away from it. But, you know, people have made a tremendous amount of money without a doubt. Can you do it through several years and through market cycles? That's the, and that's what Buffett has been able to do. <laughs> and so there's no, no such thing as getting rich quick. Easy come, easy go. I've seen, we've seen this over and over and over if you've been around in the markets. So I just caution people that uh, I thought this was interesting. And, uh, you know, people will take this different ways depending on how they're situated in the market. You know, if you're an NVIDIA shareholder and you've been on this big, I saw, you know, when Tesla was on its big rushes, you know, yes, have fun staying poor, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, we'll see if this is able to continue or if it does like a lot of, these rocket ship rides, they usually run out of run out of fuel and then come back down. Gravity asserts itself. So again, some more uh, just anecdotal nuclear news in Europe. Dutch government supports construction of four new nuclear reactors. The incoming coalition government is looking to triple the funding available for new nuclear projects, according to Power Magazine. Uh, the center-right People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, which will be part of the new government, said that officials already have a tender planned to determine the technology for the two, two, first two nuclear plants. In December, the Dutch Council of Ministers designated the Borcel site as the preferred location for two new reactors and called for a feasibility study into extending the operation of the existing plant beyond 2033. This is what we continue to see over and over and over and why I can continue to be long-term bullish on nuclear power and uranium. Um, it's, you know, again, depending on when you bought and what you bought, you're either having success with uranium investing or you're not. It's each individual person. But you see the demand continues to pull on a supply that's really not expanding sufficiently yet to cover all this demand that's coming uh, uh, 
you know, this isn't stuff that's like, again, actionable on next week, but it's all piling up on the demand side. And uh, it's, it's eventually going to assert itself. So this is the price for spot enrichment. SWU hitting new all-time industry high in May. Uh, this is a precursor to, in my mind, higher uranium demand. So people are always like getting upset about things. It's just a, this is a long-term investment. You need to look at the facts. You need to put your emotions aside. Again, when did you buy and what did you buy? That comes into the equation. Uh, I talked about that in a recent interview too. I mean, the average person probably shouldn't be buying at this point individual uranium stocks because they really don't have the ability to judge the projects uh, or the managements. And so, you know, a lot of people have bought on visions of sugar plums. And again, a lot of these things now have to be um, assessed based on what they're really doing. Uh, you know, I have a lot of producers now. So, it changes from you, you know, placing your hopes and dreams on a company to actual results and operations. And are they executing at the project level and creating cash and giving you a return, whether through dividends or buybacks? And so um, I think that a lot of people don't look at it that way, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of speculating going on and speculating is fine. Uh, but, you know, you have to understand the difference between investing and speculating, the cyclicality. You have to understand the difference between a secular bull market and cyclicality inside that secular bull market. And a lot of people don't understand that. What happens is, again, a lot of people just get drawn into the sediment excitement, like when uranium spiked to 106 and people buy at the top and then it recedes, goes into a correction. The price melts like an ice cube and they get frustrated. And then there are, you know, this... You know, how can you say that you've made your, I didn't make these uranium stocks didn't do what I wanted to do when I want, wanted them to do it. How are you saying that you've made money? I'm, I'm just saying, I don't know what you bought or when you bought it. That has a lot to do with it. So here's uh, something. There was a report says uh, U.S. Army issues request for the provision of advanced nuclear power micro reactors. Um, the Army has just issued a call for microreactor proposals to satisf satisfy its advanced nuclear power for installations program. Uh, the nuclear, nuclear Innovation Alliance commends the robust work of the Defense Innovation Unit and the sense of urgency behind this initiative. So this is part and parcel of all this money that's being thrown at nuclear power now by the government for these uh, basically... Uh, my understanding is to create these micro reactors that they can put on army bases or military bases so they can have, you know, 99.9% uh, power, you know. So this is going to help because all this money, it's probably the government's probably not the best arbiter of trying to develop new technologies, but via the military, a lot of money will be spent, a lot of it will be wasted, but it will push forward the technology and you know you will get a spillover effect i guess is the thinking that i have towards this like i said um the best way is just let prices go up and let the free market come in a lot of these tech billionaires i think are going to start pushing for private public private uh coalitions and streamlining of the process uh and because i think you know as i've said last week the the thinking around nuclear power has basically flipped 180 uh, degrees out of phase, uh, in phase or whatever however you want to say it. And, you know, this is the new thing, right? So uh, you're going to see billions of dollars being thrown at this one way or another. So here's some news from Germany. Uh, again, I, I, I've said that I think that once you get a change in government there, which I think is inevitable, as a matter of fact, we have European Parliament elections tomorrow, I think, the 9th, and we should see a lot of uh, center-right to right, right parties make big gains. Um, and I think, uh, as, as the, the example of the slide of the Dutch government uh, illustrates, I think 
that a lot of these governments, I mean, what is Germany going to be the only country in the world that doesn't have nuclear? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. They're eventually going to turn these reactors back on and build new ones. So here's, you know, you're seeing this beginning to happen. It says uh, Berlin, parliamentary inquiry to be launched into decision to close nuke plants. This is from Mar Mark Nelson off of X. I uh, just took a couple snippets out of his long uh, tweet that he made. The conservative CDU CSU opposition in Germany has declared its intention to launch a committee of inquiry considered the sharpest sword that exists in parliament. They want to explore the ministerial advice process that guided economy, ec economy, energy, and environment minister, our old friend Robert Habeck, in the energy emergency after the full scale of invasion of Ukraine in 2022. And as a member of the famously energy illiterate Green Party, he's especially vulnerable to garbage tier advice from his own clique. That's apparently what happened in this case. It seems that proper ministerial advice, quote, the nu nuclear plants can keep running, unquote, was filtered through the Green Party ideologues until it said the opposite. So we'll see what happens with this. Uh, it's going to take a change in government there, uh, but I think once the government changes and you see again the entire thinking around nuclear power has now changed everybody's for it now uh, i don't see germany uh at least if it doesn't want to regress economically and become an also ran in the european union instead of the leader uh, it's going to have to go back it's going to have to go back to nuclear power like everybody else is doing so um we shall see but i've predicted this you know it's, it's all politics it's not it has nothing to do with technology or engineering prowess or money. It's all to do with ideology and who's currently in power. That's all it is. It's just politics. So we'll see. But uh, I think that uh, eventually I'll be proved correct uh, here. So I wanted to point this out. We've talked about this before. Uh, I did want to say something. You know, gold got smacked late last week on Friday. Uh and one of the things that news items I saw is that the Chinese central bank said they didn't buy any new gold in May. I think this is, you know, to help manipulate the market. I think the long-term trend for central banks outside of the hegemon, the Anglo-American hegemon, is to lower dollar uh, holdings and increase gold holdings because gold's really the only thing that they can replace it with. There's no really other currencies. I mean, if you're the uh, Russian central bank or Chinese central bank, are you going to buy Indian rupees instead of dollars? No, you're going to buy gold. Gold is money, has been money, and is being remonetized. And so notwithstanding the fact that the Chinese made that statement, that I don't think they're going to stop buying gold long term. I mean, I think they want the price, to, you know, they can hit the price and then re-enter the market. Um, I think you'll see that. That's just, you know, I don't think that they're going to stop buying gold. Um, I think they're going to continue to buy gold, as are many other central banks around the world, uh, as they try to uh, lower their exposure to the dollar, which takes away some of the power of the U.S. to manipulate uh, politics and policies uh, around the world. And so here's the chart, right? It says gold is now 17% of central bank reserves. As you can see, it's growing over time. The red section is the dollar it's going down the amount of dollars in central bank reserves is shrinking gold is increasing so you have like the euro here um it's kind of stayed steady you have the yen so you have some other currencies but they just don't uh, here's pound sterling so the dollar is the big boy and contrary to what a lot of people think um do i think it gets back to here where gold's 90 percent like it was in the 30s of central bank reserves, no, but can it get, can it double from here? I think so. I think it probably will. And if the US continues down this path of abusing the dollar and abusing its position in the world and its reserve currency privilege, I think it's going to continue. It's not, you know, until we get a foreign policy that looks to be collaborative and work with other people who have their own interests that don't necessarily align with our interests, the way to do that is to negotiate, not you can't. We certainly don't have the ability anymore just because of the fact that these other economies are now so large and these people have interests and they want to be involved in international politics. They want to be heard. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you can find common outcomes instead of saying, if you don't do what we want, we're going to set a carrier battle group over there or we're going to freeze your assets. Um, that's my view. 
A lot of people don't share that, but it doesn't matter what you think. The U.S. is in decline uh, on several fronts. We've talked about it, about it, and so you need to prepare yourself for that. And so it doesn't have – it's kind of like Mo Green when he was telling Mike, Michael Corleone that, you know, Corleone family doesn't have that kind of muscle anymore. It's, you know, obviously Mo Green ended up getting killed, but uh, the point is made that the U.S. doesn't have the same stroke it had uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago in the world. Uh, these other economies are growing. They're becoming more uh, a larger part of the overall pie, and they have interests that they want uh, to assert, and you should engage them on diplomatic fronts looking for common outcomes. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything. The U.S. has interests also, but you know I think it's a lot more beneficial for everyone, the average person, to find win-win outcomes instead of trying to dictate things because you're just going to see the U.S. become, and it's vassal states in Europe, Western Europe, just become more and more isolated from the rest of the world. So here's Glencore. This is a international mining company. I own shares in it, uh, full disclosure. Uh, they're going to spend 50% of their capex on copper from 2020, 24 to 2026. So around 50% is allocated to copper, and then it gives you know, the things they're going to do. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I've talked about uh, coal before. A lot of people ask me about coal. Glencore is one of the few mining companies that's not divesting its coal assets. As a matter of fact, they have been uh, buying some coal assets. And so um, I think as ESG flips and recedes, um, Glencore is really set up for um you know a uh you know i'm not saying they won't spin this out i don't know what they're going to do i'm not at the board but i do like what they've been doing and uh again copper again is one of the biggest you know this electrification is not necessarily for esg it's in the emerging markets you know uh as i've said before many times as these countries get wealthier i mean i was just reading a bloomberg article before i got on this video you know, India is struggling with its uh, power needs during the sweltering summer. They've built a lot of generation, but they kind of fell into the same trap that a lot of other people, including the U.S., has, has fallen into. The grid, right? The transmission and distribution lines have not kept up with the growth in generation. You can't just keep, you know, I've seen this all the time when we go and try to put these, you can build a solar plant in eight months, right? And so where, but how are you going to get the power onto the grid if the, there's congestion on the grid you know these think of it like water pipes you can only have so much water flowing through these things and we need trillions of dollars of spending on new transmission lines new substations new switch yards all of this has a tremendous copper component and uh not only you know for the demand that needs to happen in the united states it's been ignored uh but uh around the world these emerging markets as people get wealthier requires increasingly amount of electricity and this tremendous demand on copper. So regardless of the ESG uh, component of demand, uh, which I think is not, as I said earlier in this conversation today, is probably not going to be as high as everybody thought. It's still going to be compounding growth over time just because of the continued demand that's coming from these uh, emerging markets in the global south and east. So now I'm going to get into the clown world stuff, the political stuff that people don't like. I'm going to pick on the Biden administration. There was an article. Uh, I think uh, our friend here, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, who's now the um, the transportation uh, secretary, uh, he was on one of the Sunday morning talk shows a couple few weeks ago, and he was uh, being asked about the fact that the administration – Congress had appropriated $7.5 billion for charging stations uh, for electric vehicles, and yet they've not managed to build more than seven. Um, it's interesting if you go, I'll try to, I'll put the article, if I still have it, a uh, link to it in the show notes, because it's interesting to read the article because it gives a case study of like the um, uh, Department of Transportation in Wyoming and how they wanted to access these funds and build charging stations and the uniqueness of Wyoming and how they wanted to do it at the state level and the federal government 
Canex the idea. So this is what you get into when the government is doing things, right? That's why it's inefficient. You know, you might say, well, John, you've talked about all the money that's going to be thrown at nuclear by the federal government. Yes, it will be inefficient also. OK, um, but what I'm saying is, is that uh, I think that, uh, you know, just the vast sums eventually creates a spillover. It's like a flood of money. You just don't know where it's going to go. But that doesn't mean that the government's best at uh, doing this. I mean, seven point five billion dollars is appropriated and you've only managed to build seven charging stations. Hey, Pete Buttigieg, step into my office. Why, John? Because you're effing fired, that's why. So um, you can read the article. You can see how bureaucracies and the government mucks things up. Um, so that's it, right? I mean, nothing more to say on that. It's just another clown world uh, situation. So this is what I thought was very important. I don't know why this wasn't front page news. I ran into this and I did a little bit of research. What I've been trying to do now is not just make provocative statements. Um, I try to go do a little bit of research because some of this stuff is people are going to get upset about and say, well, that's not true. That didn't happen because this has this is, has major ramifications because of our society like in the U.S. currently, our devotion to scientism and the religion of science and nothing can be questioned. Who are you to question anything, John? You're not a Ph.D. Uh, who are you to research ivermectin on your own and see? We have studies that show that it, it's just horse dewormer. You know, who are you to question climate change? We have we have all these scientists that have written all these peer reviewed papers. And so it came out last week, evidently. Uh, so we have a company, I'll put a link to this article, called John Wiley & Sons, and they are a major academic publisher. And they're currently retracting more than 11,300, quote, peer-reviewed science papers that they had previously published. These papers were once regarded as cutting-edge science and were cited numerous times by other academic researchers. Now these scientific papers, which are often taxpayer dollars, or relied on tax state payer dollars for research funding are being revealed as fraudulent. Additionally, the 217 year old publisher announced the closure of 19 journals due to large scale research fraud. I think a lot of people suspected this was going on. And again, when the government pays for research, he who pays the piper calls the tunes. A lot of people said that. And we said, and, and what did people say? You know, no, no. Uh, they have PhDs. This is all peer reviewed. Uh, who are you to question with your associate's degree PhDs? And now what we're finding out is major academic fraud, because what do these people do? They sit around and publish. I'll put a link to the article. It's even like comical. It's total clown world, guys. OK, and this devotion of scientism, I never bought into it, this devotion of scientism and what I call credentialism, not actual experience. In, in, in engineering and in science, it's, well, I have a master's degree. Who are you to question me? I have a, I've been told that, guys, uh, uh, when we had people that would do research or estimations of wind to place a wind farm somewhere. And I would say, uh, this data that you have doesn't match some things. And I would say, well, you know, so-and-so who has a PhD did this report. Who are you to question it? I said, well, I'm going to question it because I actually have to have profit and loss responsibility for this plant. And I ain't going to be able to make the numbers that are based on this data that's incorrect. And I, I've seen that in my own career. OK, and so I don't know how deep this goes, but this is exactly what a lot of people were suspicious of. And now we have this from. Uh, this report, okay? It goes on to say, these systemic issues of fraud have significantly damaged the legitimacy of scientific research and damaged the integrity of scientific journals. The academic publishing industry, valued at nearly $30 billion, faces a credibility crisis. Good, good. This is what a lot of people, you know, were suspicious of. You know, you were told to get back in your hole uh, this guy's a PhD or this person's a PhD and you're not going to question their, 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 because they have a peer revert, peer reviewed paper. And now we're finding out that 11,300 papers are, are, are bunk. 
the publisher of journals shut down 19 journals to large scale research fraud. So these guys are just on passing stuff around on a daisy chain, endorsing each other's fraud for money. It always comes back to money, doesn't it? And so qui bono, I've always said that when I was talking about climate change or the, or the COVID responses, who benefits? And so this is another example of another institution in the U.S. We didn't used to have academic, there's always going to be academic fraud because there's people involved, right? There's a certain amount of people that are just going to try to get over. But it's just like allowed now on a, on a huge scale. And so our government institutions, our academic institutions, our media, even our military, you know, have been degraded. And this is another example. And so when somebody throws a peer-reviewed paper, when we have the next, you know, they're, they're cooking up the bird flu thing now, right, for uh, this next election, okay? Bird flu is the new thing. We got to lock everything down because of bird flu. That's coming, right? And so when they throw academic papers or some credentialed person on CNN, it tells you, you know, to be scared for your life, uh, you might want to question it. You might want to question it. I mean, how many times, I mean, me in my personal life, uh, in my relationships, if somebody's constantly lying to me, I cut off the relationship. I no longer trust them. I don't deal with them anymore. And yet people keep going back to the well. I mean, it's it's genetic, right? People are Most people are followers. But this, I thought this was, uh, I don't know why this isn't front page news. Because it doesn't fit the narrative of what they want because that's what they rely on, right? They get some blonde bimbo with uh, makeup on. She, They wheel out, the producers reel out some PhD. He espouses, he's a PhD from John Hopkins. He's a PhD from Harvard. He's an MIT PhD. Anything he says cannot be questioned because who are you, little ignorant people? Well, with the internet now, and people are thinking people, okay? That doesn't mean, you know, it, it, I don't think it's a good idea to undermine uh these things but that's what they've done and they've done it for money and so i wanted to point this out because i thought this was really uh an important thing to talk about because it reaches into so many things i'll put a link to the article and a lot of things the decisions are based on this credentialism i've seen it in business i've seen it we've seen it ourselves in our own lives in the government every they bring these experts in well, who said they were an expert based on these papers we don't even know if they're true now they just make stuff up and why do they make it up? Because there's biases, there's agendas, you know, it's qui bono, who benefits? If you give me money, I'll write a paper. That seems to be how it, how it, we, we said that in the past, that we were suspicious of that. I've said that in the past. And now we're finding out that that's in fact, uh, has happened. We don't know the full extent. That doesn't mean every academic paper is fraudulent, but now again, we have to question all this stuff. I don't, I'm, I'm to the point now I'm not being cynical. I don't believe anything that the media or the government says until I can verify it myself. It's just that simple. And I think you have to, if you're if a normal person, thinking person, uh, that's going to serve you well going forward. Okay, I think that's the last slide. Yep, that's it for this week. Uh, appreciate the uh, continued support, tremendous support. We do this because... All you guys out there support us. Um, the sub stack has just blown up. Um, again, if you want to know how we're taking advantage of the things we talk about in this for specific um, uh, recommend or not recommendations, but how I'm doing it, it's basically a trading journal, what I'm doing, what I'm investing in, what I'm thinking about with specific names. You know, you can get a subscription to the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. Uh, the links are in the uh show notes we also have the free newsletter that comes out weekly where we kind of expand on these themes a lot of people have complimented me on it that they really find it useful and it's free uh it's obviously a loss leader to the newsletter but uh, i enjoy putting it out it's kind of telling you what i'm looking at what i'm reading the things that i found interesting for the week and that usually comes out uh monday or tuesday of each week and so you can avail yourself of that so that's it for this week guys appreciate it and we'll talk to you later thank you